uh, are for military purposes. So we do have a lot of military, uh, a lot of satellites up in space that are for military, for like weather purposes. We do have military satellites that do weather ma mapping, because you know commanders need to know what the weather is going to be like in you know battlefields and so forth. But a lot of satellites, you know, for our GPSs and so forth, are up in space. They're not military purposes. This is an interesting statistic, though. Ninety percent of the military satellites up in space belong to us. Okay, we are clearly, and this will be important later on when we start talking about whether or not our space assets are threatened <coughs> uh, in our space. We are way ahead of Russia, China, India, and so forth in regards to military satellite capabilities, both in quantity and in quality. Much more sophisticated technology than some of our counterparts. Twenty-three of these satellites are designed solely for early warning of a ballistic missile attack. So 23 of the military satellites we have up in space are solely for the purpose of knowing whether or not a ballistic missile is headed towards us. Now look at a couple things. This is the mapping of an airfield in Vietnam. It's going to be kind of hard to make out some of the images, but I think it's important just to contextualize historically uh, what our military satellites are. So obviously we need to they, this is the aftermath of a bombing of an Hanoi airfield, and so here in the way it's hard to uh, read, but it said, you know, runway was interdicted, they, we had 10 destroyed barracks over here, at the top six destroyed support buildings, four more destroyed, uh, four more support buildings destroyed. So it also lets us see the aftermath, what we've done. Okay? This image may or may not be familiar to y'all, maybe not. This is something, uh, this is a military satellite image as of recent, last time I want to take a guess what this might be? Yeah. Yep. The yep. Osama so, so bin Laden compound. So, certainly we use a lot of military satellites not just to take images of the compound, because obviously they have very sophisticated technology to zoom in on these things, right? This isn't like, oh, well, we think it's somewhere in there and we're just going to hope we send somebody in. Okay? Obviously, on Google Images, we get this. The military has the ability to zoom way in on these images. So, we also use military satellites to help land the helicopters you know, near the compound. I don't know if any of you all read or watched anything about the raid that happened in the very detailed, I mean, it was mapped out to the second. And it was actually, did, I don't know if any of you all saw that um, when the raid happened, there was actually, uh, there was a misstep by the helicopter, I believe, I don't know all the details, but misstep by the helicopter, but they didn't even plan for that contingency plan. Um, and so, you know, certainly things like Osama bin Laden raid, other military maneuvers are so teched out to the second. And every, you know, most, I should say most, not every, most plausible errors are calculated for and then there's backup plans. And a lot of that we couldn't do without military satellite imagery. Um, we're going to watch a short video um, about an early, uh, very early, and it actually we're still, right now our military is kind of in a transition between satellite systems. Uh, we've been a long time for decades relying on what's called the Defense Satellite Communication System. You may want to write that down. The Defense Satellite Communication System. Defense, because this is going to go straight to the video. The Defense Satellite Communication System. So DSCS is the acronym. We are very much going to be acronym to out this year, I promise you. The Defense Satellite Communication System. This is a military satellite that's placed in high orbit. It's placed in high orbit, and it provides high volume, secure voice and data communications. So this satellite capability has the capability of picking up sound. Okay? It's obviously integral to the military. It's anchored a lot of our military satellite capabilities in the last few decades. Okay? It's been an extremely valuable asset uh, for the military. We're somewhat phasing it out. We've, used, we've, we've utilized it for the past several decades. We're kind of phasing it out. So we're going to watch it's kind of an older video. We've got some cheesy videos today, by the way, which I think just makes it a little bit more interesting. So we're going to watch a, a video that you can tell, you can definitely tell it's older, um, about the DC, the DSCS, I can't even straight, the DSCS, and then in a couple minutes we're going to then watch a video about what's replacing the DC, the DSCS, the Defense Satellite Communication System. Stay on Facebook. No Facebook break, I promise. <laughs> The Defense Communications Agency is continuing the development of a worldwide strategic communications system called the Defense Satellite Communication System, or DISCUS. The Air Force is responsible for the program from development of the satellites to final orbiting and checkout. 
When the satellite is operational, it's turned over to the Defense Communications Agency. The Defense Satellite Communications System consists of four active satellites. One over the Eastern Atlantic and one over the Western Pacific. A third satellite is located over the Eastern Pacific and there is a fourth over the Indian Ocean. Up to two spare satellites are available on orbit to provide rapid replacement of failed satellites. The satellites, each with a 10,000 mile diameter view, cover the Earth, except for certain polar areas. The communications satellites are in synchronous orbits. Thus, from the ground, they appear to be stationary, turning as the Earth turns. The communication equipment handles 1,300 voice channels with a secure command capability for the satellite command and control signals. Information is received and transmitted by any combination of the four antennas. The narrow beam antennas each cover an area about 1,000 miles in diameter. They can be pointed at desired locations by ground command. The two wide beam antennas each cover an area more than 10,000 miles in diameter or the side of the Earth facing the satellite. Power for the satellite is supplied by solar cells. Three nickel cadmium batteries supply power during the sun's rays are blocked from the solar cells. Ground commands fire jets on the satellite to maintain its altitude and position in orbit. Two new advanced development satellites, Discus 3s, are slated to be launched in 1982 and 1983. The close video they will be used to test the new satellite design. Future Discus 3 satellites will be delivered in orbit by the space shuttle. Program development continues with new, higher capacity Discus 3s designed to fulfill communications needs and to meet unexpected jamming conditions in the 1980s. The Defense Satellite Communications System provides a complete global communications network serving our nation's defense needs. Okay, sorry, I know that's not quite, there's no doubt that there's space out of background music or discussions about Buzz Aldrin urinating in a space suit. But the reason why I showed this video is I do think it's important. There will be some team, a part of team this year, that their parents' the story, are you, are you awake back in the purple shirt? Awesome, great. I don't mind if you are comfortable, so make sure you're awake. Um, the, the distance program is outdated. It is, we're moving away from it, and the affirmative plan will probably do something to ramp up or increase funding and research towards the space militarization communication system. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. So I do think it is important for you to know the DISCUS program. Did y'all catch that? But that's, okay. But does anybody remember what military branch controls DISCUS? Way at the beginning of the video? The Air Force. The Air Force. Okay, how many main satellites does it have? It has two that it's on, you know, it's got four. Okay, good. Hey, yeah, some of y'all are paying attention. Good. Big long screen. Let's get through this. Well, no. Two more screens of video and then we'll do a Facebook page break, all right? So everybody pay attention. You want me to wait to check your Facebook status, all right? Okay, how, do, how are U.S. space assets controlled? It's important to know that it is out of the Air Force Space Command. Most military space operations are through the U.S. Air Force, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. So that's going to be something important for you to know in those debates. The Air Force Space Command is somewhat the, the, the I guess, sub-branch uh, that controls this. It was established in 1982. It was established in 1982. And the Pentagon, obviously, the Department of Defense is the one that created uh, the Air Force Space Command. It controls two major things. All U.S. Air Force satellites, which that's most of our military satellites are under the branch of the U.S. Air Force. So the Air Force Space Command, the AFSC, controls U.S. Air Force, okay, which you may want to abbreviate as USAF, that's the kind of abbreviation for U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Air Force satellites, and it also controls the ICBM missiles, or the ICBM force. Okay, so USAF satellites and the ICBM force. Why does it have 1982 huh? in the middle? Huh? Why does it say 1982 in the That's when it was founded. Oh, okay, sorry. That's okay. There are two main launch centers, and I think the reason why it's important to know a little bit about this is that for those of you all that are politics debaters, there may be some, but there's a reason why a lot of California, Florida, and Texas lawmakers sit on a lot of the committees that controls NASA and the space, because that's where 
A lot of our big space operations happen, obviously, Nashville and Houston, Texas. We have launch pads in Cape Canaveral. Um, one of the control centers is at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. You probably don't need to write this name. You just want to write California. And then Cape Canaveral in Florida. Okay, so I think the regions are important primarily to those of us that are pulse spinners and maybe some spins there. And knowing we see a lot of Florida, California, and Texas lawmakers on a lot of these uh, committees that congressional committees do with space. Okay, both of these launch sites have tested ballistic missiles. So if you live near the Vandenberg Air Force Base, the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base, if you've been near a ballistic missile test, uh, testing centers, and they both are taking civilian and military space launches. This is just an interesting side note and just kind of information for you to have. The military has never done a solo military manned space flight. Okay, I put manned in quotes, it's human space flight. So anytime the military needs to launch humans in space, they do that in conjunction with NASA. So the U.S. military does not have a manned military space flight program. Okay? That's a hard kind of note. Okay. We're going to now watch a video about the next, oh, no, sorry. Here's some of the other, remember we know Vandenberg on one side, Cape Canaveral are the two main launch centers. These are a lot of the command locations. So no, nowhere, well, we've got one in Houston. I don't know if anybody else is listening where close to any of these or not. Fine. I live up here in Illinois, so I don't see any up here, I guess. The closest would be South Dakota. Oh, this is a long slide, but then we'll watch, do this. Watch a quick video that's much better than the other one, and then we'll take a Facebook page. These are the primary functions of U.S. military space assets. We talked about three functions of satellites. We're broadening our perspective now. Most military space capabilities, the function of the reason why they exist, falls under one of these nine categories. Some of them are a little redundant, in my opinion, but um, so the military has very distinct reasons why these are the separate categories. So let's talk about these and then we'll watch a video about the next, uh, what's replacing DISCUS, and then we'll take a break. Okay. The first one, which we've already talked about, reconnaissance. Again, look at, ooh, double S. Okay, sorry, R-E-C-O-N-N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E. -E. And surveillance, trying to reconnaissance, again, is the source for military information. Ugh. Sorry, I'm, I'm an English teacher, so the misspellings really do bother me, okay? This is the number one function. These are somewhat in order, I think, um, when the, I found this information. Uh, I think they put these somewhat in order priority because this provides it, uh, information on just about every military operation that we would want to use information from space for. Targeting, uh, the arms control capabilities, like what our neighbors, are, both our allies and our enemies are building and so forth. Early warning. Okay, this provides the government already talked about. We have 23 satellites dedicated specifically to knowing whether or not a ballistic missile strike is headed towards us. Gives us a better time for an adequate response. Three is communications. Okay, obviously, the satellites allow commanders from kind of clear places from across the world to be able to share information. So we might have a command center in the United States that can communicate with commanders on the ground in Afghanistan. Okay, and so a lot of our military space assets communication allows that communication to occur in a much crisper, more secure um, ability. Navigation and timing. One thing that I do, which I thought is interesting, we need it, the, a huge important thing uh, in regards to effective, effective military posturing in the 21st century is vehicle velocity. I am not a physics person. Vehicle velocity and navigation and timing gives us, the, what comes out of this is we get three-dimensional images also that allows us to estimate vehicle velocity, okay, which allows us to do weapons delivery, aircraft landings, and so forth. Okay, weather, obviously, uh, you know, that people, the military commanders for planning purposes, you know the weather on various battlefield sites, remote sensing. This is to take measurements of the Earth's surface. Okay, we have to, you know, put together maps of the Iraqi terrain and so forth. Missile defense, which we'll talk about more later, obviously. Early warning means we know the missiles are coming. Missile defenses, we, we can stop them. We can shield ourselves from that missile heading towards us. Number eight, space control. This is the idea that we also, not only we put assets up in space, but we have to protect those assets. Okay? And so, number eight, that protection of those assets, assets, I said assets, because that's kind of, I guess, Part of that, um, we'll talk about space control and the protection of our space assets momentarily. And then force application, this is a future function. We don't do a lot with this last one, 
Um, but this is like the ability to conduct actually offensive operations in 